All right, thank you very much for joining us uh, on yet another exciting edition of the podcast. This actually is exciting. Um, as you can see, we're in a different location, um, as you may have obviously noticed. Uh, and we moved for a very special guest. Um, this is someone who you've hardly seen on podcasts. You've hardly seen them on television, but you know they're there, but you just, you know, you see their work, but you actually don't see the person. And today we are bringing the person closer to you. Most of you may have heard of um, Java Foods. Um, if you don't know Java Foods, you know Easy Noodles. Um, chances are you have them in your house somewhere. Uh, and so now we're going behind the story of the person responsible for that brand. Zambian, by the way, um, and there's so much pride in saying that this is a purely Zambian brand. And we're talking um, to Monica Musonda, the founder and CEO of Java Foods. She was just listed on the BBC Top 100 barely a week ago. And that just shows you, that's just like confirmation that you know what, this is it. Ladies and gentlemen, Monica Musonda, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you for having me and for your patience. Yeah, I'm like, the patience really paid off. Uh, it was a worthy moment, uh, worth the wait. And we're so happy to be here. Thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, we look forward to a very upbeating conversation for our audience. Thank you, thank you. And I must um, apologize for the hoarse voice. I'm recovering from flu. So I'll speak clearly, I hope, and people can hear me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, I think that's clear enough. We'll just yes. bump up the audio at some point. Yes. So let's let's get into the story. Um, but before that, I want to find out, like, at CEO level, like, do you have to be a morning person? Like, are you a morning person yourself? So being a CEO is being a leader. So one thing I know for sure is that even if I'm not a morning person, I show up because I lead a team and you want your team to, to, lead, by, to lead by example. And so even on my really tough days, and sometimes I, there are lots of tough days, but I want to be here for the team to know that even when it's difficult, you have to go through it. So morning, I have learned to be a morning person. So it's not really, I pr actually prefer it. I prefer to come in earlier, to get work done and go home earlier because I have a young child and I, I really feel that I need to be home for her. So I balance my day. Um, I don't work weekends, although Java does actually work at weekends, but that's what I ask my team to give of me, to give me a Saturday off so I can do my personal things, yeah. All right, and um, what's a day like um, in Monica's mm. life? So I'm um, very early start. I have a young daughter who has to get ready for school. Um, it's uh, really managing her and getting her off on her way. And in the office as early as I can. Uh, we're in the industrial area. So you know the traffic yeah, is really a nightmare. <laughs> so you have to go short window to get in and literally you stay in. So we plan our day that if I have no meetings, I come in early. If I have meetings and I stay on the other side of town, finish the meetings and come across. But I'm usually in the office early, uh, try to catch production, try to catch the team as we begin our day, uh, particularly Mondays. Mondays is always a difficult one. It's when you're turning up and turning on. So I always like to be early on Mondays. But um, that's my typical day. I'm usually here 4, 4 to 4.30 and then tell the team I'm going home. But I am available after 7. If there's anything that's urgent that need to, they need to get me, I can turn back on at 7. So, you know, you run your own business. You work every day. You don't need to work necessarily in the office. Even just reading your phone, answering requests, customer issues, you can do that anytime, anywhere. Okay. And and uh, the other thing I want to find out is what do you do to relax? Because you said weekends you don't work. Yeah. Like, are you just with your daughter at home yeah. or you go watch movies? I wish. Yeah. So lots of things. Yeah. Movies is one of them. I'm, I'm a big uh, documentary type of person. So I love documentaries and there are lots of docu-series at the moment. But I read a lot of books. I read a lot, a lot of not so serious books. So I think I'm allowed. Um, you A few business books, but it's quite nice to read lots of really good African fiction. Um, I've just come back from Nigeria and I love going to Nigeria because they've got a lot of really great fiction, a lot of uh, writers. So I when I go, I t tend to buy a lot of books. But I also like to spend time with my daughter as well. I'm and this is a really key, important time for her, quite young. You know, you have to be present as a parent yeah. and really uh, show that you're around and, you know, raise your children. And it's very difficult when you have to balance work and being a mom as well. So I do try to be very um, intentional and focused about my time with her. Great. So the people that um, hear Monica, the one thing they know is you're a lawyer. Uh, many people know that. And they relate you to Dangote. Yes. Okay. How did you find yourself at Dangote? Really interesting story and a true story. Um, I worked in Washington, D.C. for the International Finance Corporation. They're the private sector arm of the World Bank. Uh, Mr. Dangote was expanding his into cement at the time and was looking to um, for finance. 
and the IFC tend to finance big projects. And so he came into DC for a meeting to look to talk to IFC about financing. And I was one of the lawyers in the room. And he found it really curious because I was the only black person in the room. And he just he engaged me, said, what are you doing here? What do you do? And he was inter- you know, very interested at how I got there and why I was working in Washington of all places. And he says, you know, there's always work in Africa. Why, why are you here? And he gave me his card and I, I just didn't think much of it. But later on, when I was in Lagos, I got an opportunity to to actually fly with him on a due diligence trip to Zambia. And I was working for somebody else at the time. And by the time we landed, I had a job offer. So life is really interesting. Your first meeting, you might not think it's anything, but he remembered that first meeting. And when we were flying, coming here to Lusaka to look at the now plant, uh, I landed, I had an offer on the table. Yeah. So your job interview, everything was on the plane? On the plane, on the plane. And it was great. I mean, in a very much more relaxed kind of environment. And you have four hours with someone who ordinarily, maybe you wouldn't have got the four hours, right? So it was a really great opportunity for me. And uh, I actually also put my put my options out. I was like, you know, I'm very interested in hearing what you're trying to do. Um, he was expanding across the continent at the time. And, um, you know, it, it really, it worked out. It was a really great experience. It was my last legal job. And it was more than legal, actually, because he was... Um, he ran a very big uh, institution, but it wasn't just about law for him. It was about business development. It was about financing. We raised a lot of money for financing. So it was probably one of my most exciting roles before I changed. Yeah. Okay. And what was the biggest highlight of your legal career? Uh, my legal, my whole legal career. Gosh, there's so many, right? Um, when I was at Edward Nathan in private practice, the highlight for me was to set up uh, Africa practice. Yeah. So Edward Nathan is a South African firm, but they were looking to do much more work outside of South Africa. And I was the partner put in charge of that to expand the Africa practice. And for me, that was a highlight, definitely a highlight to really do more work outside of South Africa for big corporates, for governments. And I really, really enjoyed that. I think my second highlight was working with Dangote Group and raising, you know, millions and millions of dollars in financing for to finance someone's dream. And it really was financing his dream because, for instance, for in cement, he was a trader in cement. And then he had to convince people he could actually manufacture it. And he had to go out to raise the money. And with great difficulty, he did. And the minute he turned on the plant, he made so much money, people could not believe it. But, you know, and now that's why they continue to bank on his dream because he's so visionary. And actually, if I can say this now, we need many more people to bank on people's dreams today. Working with someone like Dangote, Mm -hmm. this is someone that most of us just hear about. Like we don't even imagine meeting him on a plane, you know. Um, What did you learn from someone at that level? Courage, uh, belief in self. Um, and to, to dream, to dream big, nothing was impossible. In fact, on his table, he has this uh, sort of plaque which says nothing is impossible, and it's very true. So I learned a lot of things. I also learned what hard work meant. Uh, we worked all the time, every day, anywhere, and any place. We worked a lot, but we worked because we believed in what we were doing and we believed in that tomorrow was going to get better. So I learned a lot of that, and I think I'm, I think it changed me as a person. Remember, I was a lawyer, so I was very, very much, um, you know, documentation, corporate sort of work. I began to think very differently. I began to actually see business as an option. I never saw business as an option. I never thought I could sell anything. I was a lawyer after all. But working with someone so visionary, working with someone who's got such great business acumen and someone who's willing to share that, you know, I mean, literally he brings you in his fold and say, well, let's go to Congo Brazzaville or let's look at this industry and let's dissect it. But you know, he brings you in and he's able to show you. And I remember he always used to say, are you listening? Do you hear what that meant? And I was, I was very, very lucky to have that opportunity and very grateful to have that opportunity as well. Okay. And, and also you sit on a number of boards and you've sat on a number of them even in the past. Um, tell me what have you learned about leadership and also like corporate governance from the top approach, looking at the organization as a whole, as opposed to those at operational level, middle management, what is it that you've learned? It's interesting. So I sat on my first board maybe 10 years ago, and it was a government board, and very different now to sitting in private sector, particularly private sector, big private sector businesses 
that are very structured and organized, have k- targets, have structures and teams. So it's been, it's been really a learning curve for me, but understanding that the board actually is there to support management. They're there to help you with strategic advice. They're help, there to help you uh, think of problems differently. You know, the world has really changed you know, with COVID, with all the crises. Sometimes management needs that extra support, um, that extra um, place where you can bounce off ideas, also, that extra place where they can discipline you, you know, where you say, well, these numbers don't make sense. Or how come this number is like this? Can you explain it to us? Or have you factored in X, Y, and Z that could happen to, to get you across the line? Or perhaps you shouldn't be making this. You should actually be making something else. So, you're, you know, sometimes it's always good to have an independent um, sort of sounding board. And I think that's what the board does. And I think it's, it's a function of evolution as a small business when you start off, perhaps it's not the right thing to do because it's really quite, it is very, very time consuming. It is a lot of reporting. It's a lot of uh, thinking about what you're going to tell people. But at some point it becomes very necessary. It becomes a very necessary check on uh, a reality check on what you're doing, a reality check on your numbers, um, things like that. So I think a board has taught me, for instance, to really think out of the box in running my own business. I love the boards I sit on because they're very well run businesses, very clear objectives and know how to handle risks and know how to handle financing, even how to manage a team. What I have learned definitely is that these companies, it's not one person, it's a team. So I go into every board meeting, of course, there to support the business, but also I'm like a sponge what are you doing around, you know, uh, succession planning, for instance? And I listen to how these businesses manage it. So I've got to say, it's probably another really great experience for me. Um, something you don't learn in the class. You have to actually be in a boardroom to learn much more about how businesses are run, how boards function, what management's roles are, and how you continuously grow businesses. I mean, and I absolutely, I'm, I love it. Actually, I've got to say that. All right, great. So now let's 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 focus on the transition. When did you first have the idea of starting your own business? So I had been working as a lawyer for many years. And as I said, my last job was with Mr. Dangote. And I guess I got, I kind of burnt out. I was very, very tired. We had been working nonstop for years. And then I came home. And what I realized, home being Zambia, what I realized, there was something happening here, something brewing. We had a lot of people coming into the country and building. And I kind of felt a bit left out. You know, I had lived abroad almost 13, 14 years and I was Zambian, but I wasn't here. And I had all these friends who were experiencing different things and building in their own home country. So that's the first thing I knew. I I knew I needed to come back. I didn't know what I was going to come and do, but I did know having worked many, many years in the law that I'm really really progressing. Um, I had done very many deals, very large deals. I just didn't think... Zambia, the legal profession in Zambia was at that level yet. And I just thought, well, you're going to be a bit bored. So maybe this is not what you want to do. So I knew very clearly that I didn't want to continue with the law and then began to look around. What else could I do? And there are lots of things on the, on the table that I could have done, but I really wanted to challenge myself. I also wanted to, to build, to build. I wanted to really create some form of legacy, something very different. But I also knew that, you know, Mr. X was not smarter than me. Um, they may have had different opportunities, but the, the, the country was open for all of us if we wanted to do it, you know? And that's what I fundamentally believed. And that's when I, I, I stumbled across the opportunity around manufacturing and food processing because I looked at Zambia, I looked at what was on the supermarket shelf, and I thought, but well, there's so many imports. Why are there no, n- not any more local goods? And the answer was there weren't enough local producers. And I mean, every supermarket said we would love to buy local if there was more, right? And this is fast forward now to 2022, where you have many more local goods. But in 2012, the situation was 100% different. And that was the opportunity for me. And I just thought, okay, take the leap. It can't be that difficult, actually. Um, and we should try. And I've got to say, it was definitely very difficult. <laughs> and, I, and they say, business, uh, to be an entrepreneur, you must have a moment of madness. And it's probably very true. Because you believe you can absolutely do anything when you start. And actually, you need that. Because if you were too afraid in the beginning, you probably wouldn't take the first step. 
So that first step as an entrepreneur, you can do anything, is probably the right thing. <laughs> it's very, oh, yeah. yeah. I probably wouldn't have done it if I had, if I was fearful or if I was worried if I would make it. I didn't even think about those things. I just thought, I can do it. I mean, I'm at home. Why not? There's no one who's stopping you from doing it and being bigger than you are. And that's what I believed. And actually, the truth is, in Zambia today, no one stops you from running your own business. It's you that stops yourself. And that's what I thought. I mean, in many countries, maybe you're, uh, they're, they're reserved for certain uh, people or sectors. In Zambia, you don't have that. And I, and I love that about Zambia. You can do anything you want to be. It's open to you. And it was definitely open to me 10 years ago. Yeah. And you were at Dangote. Did you quit your job and start Java Foods or you started Java Foods as a side hustle like in the beginning and then quit your job eventually? Completely impossible as a side hustle because I was living in Nigeria, right? So I actually quit my job. I actually took six months off because I just needed the break. And in the six months, then began to think of what I wanted to do. So I did have that time to myself to to, to ask to do, you know, the invest, you know, the the DD, basically go out in the market, talk to people. So I spent that time in the six months really thinking about it. And I just thought, well, I'll start Java Foods. And if it didn't work, I still had a safety net because I was obviously educated, had experience. And honestly, if it didn't work, I could get a job. Honest, and I, 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 and I still believe that today, by the way. I'm sure, I'm sure there are a few people who might still be able to hire me. <laughs> but my point is that, you know, even if you fail, um, you would have learned something from doing it. But also you, you can always pick yourself up and do something else. You know, and that's and then that's the beauty of life. What were the yeah. thoughts of those around you? Because ideally, you were working for Dang- you want to quit Dangote. Did you ever get that? Of course, my father couldn't understand it. My father, who and who this is my dad, who's very conservative, who didn't want me to to leave IFC in Washington to go to Nigeria to work for this unknown business person he had never heard of. He was like, "How could you do it? You're leaving your pension." You know all these stories. But then when I went to Nigeria, then he met him and he you know they saw the business. And then he asked me, how can you leave? <laughs> and why are you, you know, there's no need for you to come home. And my, my, they were very, you know, you've been away for so long. Why would you want to come home? You're doing very well where you were. Um, and so it was very, very much of a struggle to convince people. And actually people just thought, give her some time. She'll go back anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm still here. And, and you know what? In hindsight, I think it was great that I came back. Because remember, I hadn't lived here as an adult a working adult. I had left so many years ago. And now the benefit of being here, imagine supporting the building of this country, you know, providing jobs. We're so proud of it. You know, I'm so proud of Java and the people that I work with. So proud. And that would have been, would not have been my story had I stayed, right? Very different story, but it's such an important story. There are some people who are in jobs and are contemplating going into business. Um, in Zambia, it's very common that you've got people who are in full-time employment and they have a farm that they yes. you know, visit over the weekend. And for most of them, they, they, they think about transitioning. But the idea that what if it fails, sure. you know, really just draws them back. How did you deal with that? The idea of what if this fails, where do I go? I've never worked in Zambia. Mm-hmm. Like, where do I pick up from here? So first of all, my point about, and you're absolutely right, there are many ways to skin a cat. So many ways to start uh, your own business. It's absolutely nothing wrong with having a side hustle, right? Many, many people do that until they feel that the side hustle has become the main hustle, that it, it can look after them fairly well. And remember, people's circumstances are different. So to ask someone to do sort of cold turkey and start a business when they have maybe loans to pay off or they've got children in school and there are other circumstances, it's absolutely fine to have a side hustle. But for myself personally, I mean, I had um, saved up some money. I had kept, in, I've kept in contact with a lot of people I used to work with. And I thought, well, if it did fail, I, these were the options available to me. It might have meant I would have to leave the country again, but I felt that I was young enough to do so. I felt that um, I could take this risk. So I thought, well, two or three years, if it doesn't work out, then I know I'm dusting off the CV once again, but looking for something much more interesting to do. So and it, even if the Dangote opportunity represented itself, absolutely would go back, right? Um, I think we have such a great relationship that if I really, really needed a job, I think I could get one. Yeah, go back. <laughs> yes. and, and so in your six months of leave, um, did this, by the time the six months was elapsing, had you started Java Food? So I started the concepts. So I'd done the DD, the, 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 the uh, speaking to suppliers. So I began, I did all the homework I needed and then started Java Food. So started in October 2012, but I had been on leave the full, the, the beginning of the year, basically. Okay, so you extended your leave? Yeah. 
I mean, there, I actually wasn't leave. I literally left. So I had, I did not have a job when I, I, I had resigned. So I was not on a salary in the six months, six to seven months that I was sitting around. But again, I, 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 I planned it so that I could be able to still feed myself even though I was not working. And don't presuppose that even when I started Java, that Java was able to pay me because they weren't for many, many years. So you had to find ways, alternative ways of, of, of income to look after yourself. And that's entrepreneurship, right? You have to be very agile. I mean, you have to, to know that, okay, this is not working right now, but the pay, the, it, it's going to work out, but I need to find something today to manage my bills today. And that's the beauty of the flexibility of entrepreneurship. I can run one main business, but I can also have three or four other things on the go at the same time. So that's what I kind of did to make, help manage the transition. I still, I had board seats. I still was doing advisory work under my own name. So if there was a transaction, if you wanted me to look at documentation, I was able to do that and I would charge you a fee for it. And that's what looked after me as I began the business. And I think that's the advice I give to anybody is that don't be afraid to have many side hassles, to have alternate sources of, of, of income. You need it, particularly in the early days you, you're, where your business is still growing and it can hardly sustain you, let alone the business. So having lots of different forms of income, very important. Did Dangote ever call you to check up on how the business is doing? So we still keep in touch. I sit on one of his boards, so we're in touch. And he always, when he comes, well, he hasn't been to Zambia in a long time, but always asks me, how's the product doing? And how's your marketing? Have you grown? And things like that. So he's a you know, very genuinely nice person. Um, so yeah, he kind of keeps tabs, but he's also a very busy person. <laughs> yeah. and, and the name Java, where mm. did it come from? Okay, so I, I know I wanted to do instant noodles. And Java is an island in Indonesia, and Indonesia is the largest manufacturer in the world of instant noodles. So that's where the name Java came from. I wanted a more global-like name because, of course, we were going to be global. Yeah, global appeal. <laughs> yes. So I wanted a very a, a name which was flexible, and so Java came up, and it was easy enough for people to say and think. So it was perfect. Yeah. All right. You lead the company and yes. you've been leading it from the very beginning. Did you feel the need to find someone with manufacturing experience to manage a business? Because you just came straight from law, left your job. You didn't even go to go and do production management or whatever. Yes. You just went straight from your job and you came, established the business. How did you get to understand how manufacturing works? without having manufacturing experience. So that's the trick, the, the beauty of life, right? You have to find someone who's smarter than you, right? So for sure, it's not just production, even finance, logistics, um, supply chain issues, all that I had no idea on. So I did know I needed a, a really good team. And in fact, we needed good team players at different stages of the business. Remember, we first started off with just trading. So I really needed a strong sort of warehousing skill or logistics skill. I, need, I always needed a strong finance person. And then as we grew, then we knew that we needed to look very carefully at hiring the right team for growth. And the growth was definitely product, production. We're very, very fortunate. We have a really good team. And I, another thing I wanted to stress as well is I wanted to hire Zambians. I wanted to hire people that look like me and you. So we have many companies here who hire, bring a lot of expats in. And the problem is the, the skills transfer to Zambia is very limited. But most people, everyone here at Java looks like me and you. They are, they are black, African. They are here to grow this business and Everyone, you know, there's no other new instant noodle uh, uh, manufacturer in Zambia. So we've grown the skills ourselves. So everyone on the line didn't know the skill before. They knew it. Na they know it now. And that's significant for us. You know, that it's really important that we, we get people and we skill them and they do their job well. So my job, as you say, I merely lead the, the strategy of the business. I'm the thinker. I'm the planner. I'm the one who is cold when they need financing. But the actual day-to-day -day operations of the business have several different heads and who are very, very competent. And that's the growth, you know? Uh, five years ago, very different. Maybe they only had one head of department. And now we have five or six and growing because now we split the businesses in several several departments to be for efficiencies, for specialization. Um, and that's what happens after a period of time. You grow. So I have people who think and who are smarter than me. <laughs> That's what helps. <laughs> Maybe for context, how big is, is Java for? So direct employees, we are 68 people. Um, that's this year to 2020. We're probably going to grow to 
over 105 next year because we're, we're adding another shift. And then we also do indirect uh, employees as well. These are people who work for us when we have a lot of business that needs to go out. So people who come and pack for us, um, who are casual, uh, you know, come on and off. And those could be 15 to 20 people ad- additional. So we really do have an impact on the ecosystem around us. Let's talk about financing, because in Zambia, that is why people don't start businesses. There's no funding, capital, yeah. banks don't give to startups, whatnot. How do you raise financing for, for this company? Yeah, and, and you know, it's still really a painful topic for me. Even with my 10 years of growth, how I still have to fight to get even more financing. You know, we have really great ambitions for the business, and we really struggle with the cost of financing. It's still very, very high. Uh, and that impacts on everything. You know, when you're competing against South African companies who are borrowing at way less than you are um, in currencies they, they can afford, and then you are, are, are borrowing at such a high interest rate, it's really, really difficult. Um, and we see, we see the differences in, in how multinationals are treated and how local Zambian co- companies are treated. We're so much more of a risk that they lend f- smaller amounts higher interest rates, if you can even get it. It's also really hard to get. The, the, the documentation, the hoops you have to jump through to get it. And this is me at 10 years, right? Um, and still having to go through that ho- those hoops. Um, and I think a lot needs to be done about how we finance businesses differently if we are serious in this country about growing, um, you know, private sector business. We cannot, we, it is impossible for businesses to grow if you're borrowing at over 20%. Right. Uh, I remember borrowing at 28 percent in 2014. And it, it meant that we were going to fail. How do you borrow at 28 percent per annum? And there are people who probably borrow, borrow at much higher rates. Right. So I think and there needs to be better thinking around this. There needs to be um, thinking around rules around security, around um Allowing businesses to start up, you know, they, at that critical startup stage, they don't have the revenue, they don't, they're not profitable, they have a great idea, but they need the support. So how can we help fund them so that they get to a point where it become, they become less risky? Sort of like you need more venture capital at that, uh, the early stage financing. And that's what's missing in this market at the moment. Early you told stage. a story um, um, about how you were going to this meeting to get funding and then you were disappointed. Yeah. Several times, by the way, several times. It still happens. How did that change your, your perspective? Did that, did, did that draw you back? Of course. I mean, it always draws you back because you think that, you know, everyone buys into your story and buys into your commitment because, you know, it is commitment. I'm not doing anything else except running this business when I could be doing lots of other things. But fundamentally, I'm focused on this business and I'm asking you to lend me money to grow the business I am running, right? Uh, I'm not about to sort of run off with your money. So you hope that people can see your hard work and your commitment to the business and your, and your, and, and your promise to pay back, right? And not, they don't always see it that way. In fact, they don't see it often because then they look at the sheet and say, do you qualify for A, B, C, and D? And if you don't, then they can't lend you the money. So it is really, really still very, very difficult. And I, as I said, we need a different type of lens on, particularly for Zambian SMEs, if we really want to you know, move the dial on this. Do you think you would have had it easier if you're not a black woman running this business? Hmm, it's an interesting question. I have no... I think it would have been easier if I was a qualified, um, I don't want to say man maybe, but also with maybe a, a bigger name behind me. So often they, they look for who, who is your shareholder. So if your shareholder is a, a big company, um, is outside of the country, then they know, okay, we're fine because if they default here, they'll write a check. If you have no one behind you, they're not willing to take the risk. You know, I think it would have been different had I had a partner early on who was a big, uh, a big name. Um, I think it was maybe a slightly easier if I was a man with some experience because I think, um, uh, let's, let's call a spade a spade. Uh, they would have perhaps given me a little bit more money um, because they felt a little bit more secure. For many women, they, they think we're doing this as a hobby and that will stop when we feel it gets too tough and, uh, and we, won't, we won't go through it, you know, which is unfair, really, really unfair. Um, but a lot of us have actually gone through it, gone through the hoops and we're still here. And we should have been supported much earlier on. All right. There's a story of the guy on the plane who thought uh, you were running a restaurant. Yes. <laughs> yes, the guy who said to me, what do you do? And I said, I'm in food processing. And he said, what's the name of your restaurant? 
And I think in his head, he couldn't, the two were the same, you know, and, and, and you, know, you can't be disappointed because in his mind, that's, he just couldn't see me as a woman actually running a factory. So I was like, well, you can't hate, you can't hate him for that. All right. And at some point, you had to put your house as collateral. Yes, because we didn't have any assets at the time. Remember, we were a small business. You don't have any assets under the business, but you're the founder uh, and you're the one who's pushing the business idea. So you use whatever you had. And I had to put my house as collateral for a loan. What, what mistakes did you make in the beginning, 10 years ago? Oh, several mistakes. Uh, I think trusting people. I mean, sales is your most important department. And trusting that people won't run off with your money. Lots of times people have run off with my money. Uh, lack of understanding around uh, food safety issues. You know, food is really quite specialized. You have to understand things like shelf life. You have to understand how the market takes it. So, for instance, you can't really put a product on the shelf if it only has three months left of shelf life. So we learned things like that the hard way. Um, I had to go back to the drawing board to make sure we had long shelf life. Um, we made lots of mistakes around the market. We didn't appreciate that you don't get paid right away, that it, it takes much, much longer to get paid. And therefore, you need to also stretch your obligations, your payment obligations, because you don't have money. And then you quickly get yourself in a, a situation where you, you owe someone money. Someone owes you money, but they are going to pay you in 30 days. So the pressure around credit was really very hard. And I had to learn the hard way how to manage it. How did you scale the business? Uh, a, a step at a time. A step at a time. Uh, a little bit of luck as well. I think uh, the product began to do very well. And once it began to do very well, we're able then to use the money to grow the business. I think it's, it's everything happens at the, at the right time, at the right pace. And you use that little bit of more money to hire an additional person, to buy an additional truck, to add on a new product base, things like that. So we are, we're very fortunate that we, we went through it. We went through the pain of allowing the business to grow, hiring f more people when, the, when, when we had more roles and things like that. So that's how we scaled. And then we really scaled it from 2018 when we decided to bring in some partners. We, we felt that we needed to do something very, very big and dramatic. Um, you're sitting in a new factory, which was funded from the, the, the money we made raised in 2018. So we did, we decided to do something different. We decided to share the pie with people who would invest in us. And, um, we closed with two shareholders and their money basically built the factory we're sitting in now and helped us buy a really state of the art noodle, uh, line. And this is what we're, we're, we're working with today. All right. For many people, they're, they're very skeptical about bringing people into their business. How do I determine the right people to bring into their business? Because if I get it wrong, I may even end up losing the business. True. And that's a very good point. Um, and many a time, even myself, I, I really scratch my head and say, well, are these the right business partners? So I think you have to be very aligned in what you want to achieve in your business and also very aligned to say, will they help you achieve that? And you have to remember that it is your business and that anyone you bring into the, in the, into into your, into your home or into your business is helping you achieve your goal, right? And I think that's what you really have to be very clear about. And they are, and also very clear that are they financial investors or are they, you know, expansion investors or different investors, right? And knowing what they're going to bring to the table. So I think for me, um, I was fairly lucky. I found very like-minded people and people who genuinely like me and the business. Um, they like my leadership style. They like um, how I work. And also people don't want to lose money. So they invest in people they, they, they think can get them through. And I feel that, that we here at Java, the management team and myself, have been able to show our new shareholders this, that um, we have absolutely scaled the business. We've said what we've, we've done, what we said we we're going to do. Uh, we've grown brands. We have uh, exported. Uh, we have focused on the key things that matter to us. And I think that's, it's been a good partnership. But you're right. Getting it wrong is really painful, really, really painful, and sometimes can destroy the business. You seem to be like doing very well in terms of the Zambian market because um, when I think about noodles, I'm thinking easy. I, great, there's great, no other noodle brand that great, comes to my mind. Great. And you said the challenge you have is that you're dealing with these international competitors. How have you dealt with them as a Zambian business? You started small, you're only 10 years old, but you seem to be dominating the noodle market in the country. Really interesting because I think a few of our international competitors make mistakes which help you then get your way through. So I like to think that your international competitor doesn't necessarily think you're a big market. 
And so they ignore your consumer. They don't talk to you. They offer you products which you don't really want. They're also really expensive. So you look at all those price points or you look at those characteristics and say, well, how can we play in this area? How can I be speaking to my Zambian consumer much more to show that I'm a product for you? You know, um, and that's what really helped us. I think it helped us. We're in a space where there are very few players. Um, something to think about as you grow a business. You don't want to go into a crowded space because you probably find it very hard to grow. So we went, we were in, we were working in a space where really we had a lot of imported, uh, competitors. But who were not speaking to my consumer. And my consumer was a Zambian consumer who was, uh, young, um, living in an urban area, uh, and didn't have a lot of money. So we began to speak to them and we gained the loyalty and the trust over that, that consumer base. And it's really helped us today. All right. And what are some of the key lessons you've learned about business along the way? Yes, always get paid. <laughs> so key lessons is uh, before you spend too much money growing, don't, um, getting a fancy office and buying lots of cars, make sure you understand how you are either selling a service or a good, how you get paid, how you bring money into the business, understand how the business actually works and functions, you know, in order for you to actually grow it. Because you may be selling, you know, red pencils, but actually the country wants blue pencils. And understanding that if I shift, I'll do much better. You know, it's all those things, really understanding the business, understanding the market, understanding uh, what, what people want and what they're willing to pay for, you know. And once you crack that, then everything begins to change because you and you can have one winning product, by the way, like we have here at Java, where one product is super, super special. Easy Noodles is our biggest revenue earner. We love Easy. And then we have a few limping cousins, as we call them, who, because we're not market leader in those spaces, uh, we really struggle with them. And then we really question whether or not we should be doing them, right? So we go through all of that, but we really, uh, we understand much, much more who we are as a business than we were 10 years ago, right? But it's really, really understanding the nature of your business. What is the success what will not make you successful? Understanding your cost base, as I said, understanding your market um, and understanding where there's room to grow because there might not be room to grow. It just so happens in some sectors that, that it's really, really crowded. It's probably not the sector you want to go into because you probably will only grow 5% as opposed to a sector where there are only two or three players and you can grow to 50%, right? So it's, it's, it's really thinking differently like that. And what are some of the hard choices and sacrifices you've had to make for easy to be where we are seeing it today? Definitely using personal money, uh, my pension money to, you know, put in the business. I meant if I probably die today, I think there would have to be a go fund for my daughter. Um, and these are things you think about all the time. Like, should you be putting all your savings into a business which could potentially fail? So now I'm a little bit more um, conservative because I do have family to look after. I mean, earlier on, when I first started, I put everything in, into this. My time, my money, my contact network, everything was put into it. Um, and sometimes you have to do that. It's the only way to lift it up off the ground. 100% commitment. 110% commitment, in fact. Um, so definitely, um, yeah... I, I put in everything, even personal time, to, to sometimes detrimental to your personal health. You know, they say you do need to rest. It's true. You cannot be on the go 24-7. You then feel the pressure. And in the early days, it was very, very much like that. In the early days, I was out in the marketplace doing samplings. I was out selling. I was in the office trying to think of strategy. I was speaking to banks. I was everything to every person because it needed to be done in the beginning. But later on, when we got a team, it's a lot less, but also much more strategic thinking, much more uh, thinking around financing, about growth, about partnerships, around what we need to get the business over the line. So very different from when we started. You, you are Monica Musonda. When people hear you, they think, Monica Musonda, the big entrepreneur, work with Dangote. Do you feel the pressure to live this life of what clothes you wear, the cars you drive, the house you live in? And do you feel that? Look at me. <laughs> I don't think so. I'm very casual, right? In fact, I'm very, I don't, I, I don't, for me, my, I, I take pleasure in different things, right? I don't live for people. I'm also much older. I, I, I've worked for such a long time that those things don't 
but I don't worry about what people think about what car you drive. And I just, I really focus on what I'm here for. And I keep my, 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 my network very small, my close friends very small, because they know I, I, I prefer it that way. I, I definitely am, I hear you when you say, oh, I'm Monica Musonda. I definitely have a role to play in terms of influencing people. And I hope I do it positively by focusing on different things. I don't focus on what you're wearing and what car you drive. I focus on what you need to do to achieve success, to uh, to be fulfilled in your life, to hopefully have a, a good positive legacy. I hope that's what I'm trying to tell people. I'm also trying to uh, get more Zambians inspired to join us. You know, um, private sector in Zambia has for many, many years been dominated by other people apart from Zambians. And it can't be like that. We cannot grow this country if we allow other people to do it, right? We all have to get involved. And I hope that is the Monica Musonda that people think of, you know, the, the one that says, I'm, you know, I've done it. Please join us because you probably will do it better. I'm the one that may, ha may have opened the door um, and you really push it open. I hope that is what I, I, I tell the Zambians, you know, I'm not here to, to, to share, you know, modern hairstyles. And it's just not who I am. Yeah. All right. And you mentioned relationships. How did you leverage relationships to get here? Because now in Zambia, people have this negative thing of, no, you need connections, you know. Mm -hmm. But how did you leverage relationships for you to get where you are today? And interesting, because I remember I've, I've been abroad for very many, many years. So I had to build a lot of relationships locally because I hadn't been here. But what's really, really, really important is that uh, being a person of integrity, professionalism, um, and, you know, doing what you're saying you're going to do really brought me far because many people knew me when I was a lawyer, knew what I stood for, knew how I worked uh, and trusted me because of that. And they said, well, Monica says she's going to do this. And actually I know Monica and she will do it. You know, if we, if we give her this money, I, I very much doubt that she's going to go buy a Mercedes. She's actually going to try to really make it work. And if it doesn't work, it's not because she didn't try, you know. So I, I think it's really standing on or allowing your contact network to know who you are as a person. And I think I encourage everybody to, 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 to do the exact same thing. Let people see who you are. Let them believe in your story. And then they'll believe in your business. So that's what really helped me. People who initially gave me money in the, in the initial days knew I had no background, but knew that this lady is going to really give it everything she got. Even if it fails, you know, she, she tried. Right? And, and how do you think young people can build more meaningful relationships for, for that work, for their career or their business? Yes, I think, I think it's really um, coming out uh, much more focused about what you want to do in your life. Um, of course, there are many options today and there's nothing wrong with having two or three options. But I think being very clear and focused and a lot of integrity is key. You know, if you borrow money, pay it back. If you say you're going to be somewhere at five, be there at five. You know, be, be respectful for others. And then people begin to see you as a person and begin to trust you and will trust whatever you want to do, right? Will actually take a bet on you because it, you are a good person. And I think that's, that's the first thing. Be that person, the right, good person. It changes a lot of things. All right. And, and talking now about your leadership, what would you say is your leadership style as CEO? So I'm much more, I'm much more patient now, right? I mean, I, I came from an environment which was really, really sort of go, 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 go. But now I'm very much more patient. I'm much more inclusive. Remember I said that I don't know everything and I've had to hire a team. So I really am much more inclusive about even with things I don't know. You know, it took me a very long time to read a, you know, P&L or balance sheet. And I had to really engage someone and say, actually, I don't know. Will you show me? What does this number mean? So I'm much more inclusive about my leadership style. I'm much more, um, I allow for people to also blossom, right? Um, but I'm very, I'm very much about leading the way. You know, this is the direction we want to take. Um, I am clear about that. And I, if you want to join us, join us in this direction. But I value your, your contribution and feedback, but we're going down this road. <laughs> yes. And, and how do you find, how did you identify the right people in the beginning? Um, and I'm asking this because I know that for most entrepreneurs, the business starts on your own. Yes. Like I'm on my own, I do this, I do sales, I deliver, I market everything. It's hard to pick on the next person to join the business. How, yeah. Like, how do you strategically pick people? So, by the way, trial and error. I mean, I, I don't. I, I must say that I, I don't know it all, and I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning because you look at someone's CV, and today you can get a CV on, on Google and do well, and then actually, person has nothing, right? So, we also made a lot of mistakes when we hired. We hired people 
who we thought knew better than us. And then we discovered very quickly that they didn't know anything or were not the right people for us. I mean, we are a Zambian business and we, we want people who are enthusiastic about what we believe in and what we drive and our focus. And if you're not, if that's, if, if your drive is a hundred percent money, for instance, we don't want you to work for us because we want people who love what we do want to teach others, want to grow Zambian brands, want to grow a Zambian business. I mean, that for us excites us. So we love young, enthusiastic people who, who, look, like, who look forward like that, right? But it's been trial and error. I mean, you get referrals sometimes, you go to um, a, a recruitment agency sometimes. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But you dust yourself off and you try again tomorrow. And, and, and how do you get people to buy into your vision? Because like you say, it, it's... In the beginning, you mentioned you were just helping Dangote with his vision, yes, you know. Yes, yes. And I'm happy you mentioned that because you, as the one who's under him, realized that. Yes. But for others, it's just like, ah, that's Monica's company and whatnot. No. How do you then bring them along? How do you align them? So, so it's a lot of talking. You know, um, I spend a lot of time, particularly in the interview period, and even when they first join the business, it's really trying to let them see who we are, let them see why we do it, and be very have a very open door policy um, that you can come in and say, but why, why are we doing this? Or why do we do it this way? And try to very much get people to buy in, you know. Um, and a lot of people we have here buy in. It's not that hard huh, to buy in on wanting to, to be different, to be top, uh, to be the best instant noodle brand. Uh, you know, it's not that difficult. It really is about making sure you get the right team in. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then the other thing I want to find out is um, what impresses you the most in an employee? Commitment. Enthusiasm to learn, um, uh, love of the brand, of the business, you know, uh, really wanting to be part of the growth of the business always makes me very happy. You know, people who you don't, you don't need to be here, but they're fighting your battle for you. I love that about, um, about, about our employees. Also love the fact that they love their home, home country. They want to see the change. I love that when, you know, people are here because they want to grow Zambian businesses. And I love that. Yeah. For, for many people, um, you've got this culture in your head that you want to, you know, create in your organization, but actually creating that culture, you know, is, is, is something else. It's the hardest thing. So mind you, and this is 10 years of my business. I, I wouldn't have spoken culture at year five. We were just talking about survival, you know, but year 10, it really is about putting in the right culture. What does Java stand for? Who is a Java employee, you know? And I spent this year actually very much trying to nurture that trying to see what we really stand for, trying to help our employees grow into these great Java employees, trying to make everyone understand the vision because it's no longer my vision anymore. It's the business's vision and all of us make the business. And do you understand what we're trying to achieve? So we had a really great video um, out on ZNBC last week and I got the team to t talk about it. And it was great to hear them say that we want to be the biggest instant noodle manufacturer in Africa, or I want to see the product I make on every shelf around the continent. That's, those are not my words. Those are their words. And it's great when you hear that, you know, when people buy in. That's really important. And, and, and do you feel like you've built loyalty in your employees? To some extent. I think there's still quite a lot of work we have to do. I think... Uh, our employees also want to also experience the world. You know, I'm really hoping in the next few years with our partnerships, we'll be able to take some of our employees to work with some of our partners for, you know, two or three months. You know, we want to also help people develop and get this great experience. So we're hoping that we can support them around training. We're hoping we can really improve compensation and benefits. We're hoping that we can really just... Um, Say what we're going to do. I think it's more than just now building brands. You know, it's now it's about who we are as a team. All right. So you've mentioned that as at corporate level. Yes. Now let's bring it down to the young entrepreneur who you only have two people, for yeah, example. Yeah. You know, how do you get them to? So look, I think it's at different stages. Remember I said culture comes much later, right? At, at the early stage of the business, I think what your focus is, is does the business work? <laughs> I mean, does it really work? Is it really going to be a business? By the way, things start off, sometimes it's just, it really is just a hobby. But is this cake making? Is this pickle making? Chili making? Can it really be a business that I can scale? So I think at that stage, what you're trying to do is work with someone who can help you achieve uh, business success or they say proof of concept, you know, that it's going to actually run as a business. And that's all you need to be focusing on at that early stage. Can this be a business? The rest of the stuff comes later. 
it actually will automatically come later because if the business works and it grows, you can't be just two people anymore. You may have to be three, four, five or six, and then you all have to be on the same page. Please, can we all report at seven hours so we can do A, B, C and D? That's establishing the culture, you know, that's establishing commitment, but that comes later. So I think my advice to, in the early days is focus on, on really understanding the business and on proving that it is a business that you can take it from the back of your house into a shop, that you can actually, you know, hire another person or two people, right? Uh, that you can regis- register it at PACRA. You know, really, are you, can this business grow? How do you know the business won't work? You'll see it in the numbers. I mean, definitely a business doesn't work if it's not generating income. And um, I, I say this carefully because for many, many years we were loss making, but we could see the light. Huh? So it's not that you have to make profit on day one, but you have to see that the business is growing. So I had two customers last year. This year I have 10. And actually next year I'm going to have 50. I may not be making a profit, but I'm growing. That means the business is growing. That means the business has possibility for success. You can see the growth. Right. I think the problem is where you don't see the light, where you still only have two customers. And in fact, those two customers don't pay you on time. Uh, they want a different color. Uh, they don't like how you deliver and they give you so much more headache. And you're like, actually, this business doesn't work. Actually, I need to change the business or do something else. You know? All right. As we come to an end, um, do you plan to venture into another business? So I think differently, I think I have done 10 years of running my own business. I think uh, the next 10, of course, Java is still going to be here. But other businesses, I think I'd rather be uh, a silent partner. Uh, I'd rather someone else run the business. I think it's really, it is very difficult to run a business at scale in Zambia. And I think I'd rather be that person on the board as opposed to running the business. So I think the next 10 years for Monica will continue to be focusing on growing Java, but also to be an investor in uh, other types of businesses, to be a partner for other people. So I'm always very interested in other people's businesses. If they're doing well and they need a partner, I'll be very interested in that to support them. You know, a few people took a bit on me very early and it'll be good for me to do the same, you know, for businesses which actually I'm interested in, I understand it and make sense. I would be happy to be an investor in those businesses, yeah. That is good. And do you see Java as a generational business? Like your children, their children, their children? I hope so. But, you know, today, you know, kids can choose whatever they want to do, right? I really do hope it will be a generational business. I think that's also a, an issue for many of us in Africa that businesses are not generational. Uh, you know, the, the founder dies and everything collapses. I really hope that we'll be able to put in the systems uh, that it doesn't have to go that way. But by the way, around the world, it often, it's often the case. Huh? Um, I, had a, I was watching a very interesting um, documentary on Gucci, the, the luxury label, and none of the Gucci family are in Gucci. None of them. But they grew the brand and then they sold it off, but the, obviously still carries the brand name. But so it's not unusual to see that, that the founders may not necessarily be a part of it, or they're very, very small percentage, but the, the, the company lives on. And why do you think most businesses in Zambia, run by Zambians, fail to grow, fail to scale? Where do you think the problem is? So I think a couple of things. I think it, it depends on the basis of the business. I mean, we've seen a lot of tenderpreneurs, a lot of businesses who, who have grown on the fact of government patronage. We know those are not going to work, right? So if there's a change in government or the person who had the, be- the best contacts, with the, you know, whoever it is, passes on or, you know, something happens to him, those quickly die. I think it really depends on the nature of the business. I think that structures you put into place for continuity, if you have professional staff and structure, I mean, even if you can step away from the business for one month, then you know that actually maybe there's a possibility that this can continue. So I think we have to think of um, business differently, structure it differently, so that it can actually continue beyond you. And I think that is our struggle, the continuation of the business. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what three books would you recommend to our audience? The Power of Habit, um, which I like, I can't remember who wrote it. I love it because it's about, um, and because I sell, I'm um, fast moving consumer goods, I, it talks about how you can get brand loyalty, how I get you coming back. Simple little things like, um, when you brush your teeth and it has that nice smell and fragrance of cleanness, that creates a habit because you feel every time you brush your teeth, that 
um, you're clean and that creates the habit. So I love that book. It's a business book, right? I love that. Um, I, I, I just recently read Indira Nui's book. Um, and Indira Nui it was the CEO, the former CEO of Pepsi Cola. She's from India. Um, it's a fantastic book she's written about her, her, her life, about how she came out of India and has became the CEO of Pepsi, a Fortune 500 company that she chaired. She wasn't even American, right? And so I love it. And also because she's a woman. I love that. And um, I think it's called In Her Stride or In Her... I, I have to look it up. I've just finished reading that. So my, and my third book, I have to think about the third one, um, which really has had an impact on me. I come back to it. But I think those two have been really, really good uh, for me. And I, t I, I love those things because they're very inspirational as well. They really make you think, think about what you're doing. And also, it also relates to yourself because... You know, the stories are not, are pretty similar. Everyone has had their own back struggle. Everyone has started small. Everyone was not accepted. And then something happened. Uh, I think the third one would be by um, Phil Knight, um, the shoe dog, which is a story about Nike. Nike is so interesting because that man ran losses for many years and he had, he had a main job. He was an accountant before he 100% began selling shoes, right? So really, it's, it, it really is about just believing in, in the story and, and, and believing in the struggles, that the struggles may come to an end. So all these three books are really interesting, I think. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. And what would your top five advice be to, to young people? Um, think out of the box, the first one. I think uh, do not be afraid to do something different. So do not, because everyone is painting the walls green. It doesn't mean your, your wall needs to be green. So think out of the box. Look around you at what people, your, your friends, your community are willing to pay for. No point in building a rocket if no one's going to pay for it, right? Um, so look around, really look around you if you're in a business. Um, if, if I sold meringues as opposed to birthday cakes, is there a market for it? I think start small. Have one paying customer. So if you're working in the back of your, your house, it's absolutely fine because it's all the concept about starting small, about managing your expenses, managing your customer base uh, until you're big enough and the, the business can support you moving on. So starting small, understanding your business much more. Um, have one paying customer who pays on time every time, please. That guy will get you, or that lady will get you through your hardest night. Because you know on the 25th, I always get a check. Always have that one paying customer. Even when it's raining and it's really difficult, I think always strive to have that one pay, pay, um Be passionate. You need to be passionate because when it's tough, and it will be tough, I promise you, it's always going to be difficult. Uh, even at 10 years, it's still difficult for me. But I'm passionate about what I do. I'm very clear about why I'm doing it. And that carries me through it. So you've got to have passion. And the last one I think is have fun. Don't take life so seriously. I think laugh at yourself. Yeah, you know, many, many times when you need to laugh instead of cry, right? <laughs> so laugh, but enjoy it such that when you, when you, when you live to tell the story, it's not all doom and gloom and suffering, but there's some fun times too. There's some really good times and that you can turn, look back and think, actually, that was actually a great ride. So make sure you have fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, for the conversation. And not the time. at all. Not at all. I'm happy yeah, to do uh, it. It's, it's, it's good actually to, to tell, to tell um, real Zambian stories because then people begin to understand, ah, if Monica can do it, I can do it. Absolutely. If yeah. not better. I must say that because remember I had nothing. Didn't know very much. Made a lot of mistakes. The person after me or the women or men after me will do much better than me. Yeah, they've got your story to learn from. And now with, with the whole world basically on your phone, like the endless nothing possibilities. Nothing is impossible. Yeah, yeah. Nothing no, is thank possible. you so much. And wish uh, Java all the best. Uh, we look forward to your 15th anniversary. Thank um, you. Do you guys have a party for 10 years? So uh, it, we, what we did is really celebrated our staff and our customers. So, and we, we went out to tell the story. So we celebrated differently. We didn't have a party. We, we told the story. So we did videos, uh, which went out. Uh, we thanked our customers, our key customers and stakeholders. And we thanked our team. So we really let them really enjoy the 10 years. And I think that's, that's the most important. Maybe at 15, we'll have a party. <laughs> All right. Is there a question you wish I asked you that I didn't? Um, no, I think, I think you answered it all. I think, I, don't be afraid to start is another thing. I think people always think that it's a perfect moment yeah. to start a business. There is never a perfect moment. <laughs> no, thank you so much, uh, Monica. No. You guys, uh, that's been our conversation today. Uh, 
don't forget to buy his in those. Uh, but I feel please. like I'm preaching to the choir because <laughs> <laughs> they buy more. But because please I, buy more. The thing is, I, I feel like there's. I don't think there are people who don't know is in those. Because someone was asking, do you know money comes on? I said no. Do you know Java food? Said no. Do you know easy noodles? Said yes. Yes. So That's, the easy noodles. And I like that, by the way. Let them know easy noodles. They don't need to know who I am. But <laughs> well, let them know the brand. That's no, thank great. you so much. Thank you for having me. No pleasure, ours.